Let me say about the next five to 10 years, the internet will be everywhere and nowhere. Even in your contact lens, you simply blink and you will be online. And who were the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. They will blink and see all the answers to my exam right there. And think about it, on a blind date, your, your date says that he's single, he's rich, he's unattached, but your contact lens says, nope, he's married, he's a loser, <laughs> he, has, he has three wives to support. So it can be very handy having that. And then for energy, we will have fusion power. In two years time, in France, there will be an announcement that for the first time we've captured the power of the sun on the earth, that we have break even, that we can create as much energy as we put into it. What's the energy source? Seawater. Seawater, the hydrogen from seawater can be burned in a fusion reactor to give us unlimited energy, energy from the stars on the earth. And then in your living room, we will have the ability to detect cancer years before a tumor forms. A blood test, a simple blood test is now available commercially to detect 50 types of cancer in your blood. In the future, it'll be your saliva. In the future, it'll be your, your toilet, in your bathroom. Your bodily fluids will be analyzed quietly and tell you that you will have cancer in five, 10 years. In other words, the word tumor could disappear from our language. We may no longer say tumor anymore. That's how fast biotechnology is moving, that one day we will treat cancer like the common cold. That is, we can't cure it, too many forms of the common cold, too many forms of cancer, but it won't kill anyone in the future. And so we're talking about a bright future where intelligence, the internet is everywhere and nowhere. Within 50 years, the word digital will disappear from the English language because computers will be part neural. We will, we will connect the computer to the living brain. So we will have telepathy. We will think, turn on the internet, turn on the lights, move objects, dictate manuscripts mentally. This means that the internet will become brain net. We will telepathically communicate with the people of the world. We will record memories. We will record emotions on the internet. This means that the movies, television, will become obsolete because the movies, television have no emotions, they have no feelings, but that's what the brain net will give you. The ability to feel what other people are feeling, to communicate, mentally with other people. So in other words, BrainNet is gonna revolutionize the internet. The next level of the internet will be when the human mind is connected to the computer. And then what about the computer itself? The computer itself, the digital computer, will become junk. We will go to quantum computers. I'm a physicist. We physicists know that the quantum theory is what governs the atom. And we will create computers that compute on atoms. These are the ultimate computers, computers that will make digital computers obsolete, quantum computers. And what can we do with it? Perhaps cure incurable diseases, because quantum computers can work at the quantum level, at the level of viruses, bacteria, at the level of diseases, and we'll be able to cure Alzheimer's, cure Parkinson's, cure forms of cancer, because these are gonna be at the molecular level. And so we're talking about a whole new era. And then, once we conquer these diseases, 
there's a possibility of immortality. That is, living beyond our years. Two types of immortality. One is digital immortality, where we are digitized, and that digitized image lives forever. We are doing it now. Every time a teenager makes a stupid prank on the internet, it's recorded forever. It's part of your biography, all the stupid things you did as a child. In the future, all of that will create an avatar that looks like you, talks like you, has your memories, you will live forever on the internet. I would love to talk to Einstein. One day he will be digitized. I would love to sit down and talk to Einstein, find out what he was thinking about for all these years, his dreams, his hopes. One day we will be digitized. We will talk to our descendants. Realize that when you go back to your family tree, how far does it go back? Maybe two generations. After two generations, your family tree disappears in the sand. Nothing left of them. Now you will live forever in a digitized form as an avatar. And then we will have biological immortality. Why do we die? We die because of errors. Errors build up in our cells, in our genes, in our hormones. These air buildup is why we die. But now with genetic engineering, we can dream of the possibility of correcting these mistakes, correcting the errors that develop in our genome. And that means perhaps extending the human lifespan. There is always a danger that technology can bite us back. Every time we invent a new invention, like a bow and arrow, a bow and arrow can be used to kill food so that we can eat. But bows and arrows can also be used to kill people. So there's always that danger. But I think that the internet has a moral direction. Because what does the internet bring us? Knowledge, enlightenment other people's point of view. That means that we can unleash the powers of democracy. People have a voice. They didn't have a voice before. Democracy thrives when people have a voice, and that's what the internet brings. So I disagree with people who says that technology is neutral. Yes, technology can be used to kill, but in the larger sweep of history, technology brings empowerment. People who are powerless become empowered in the future, and that is irreversible, an irreversible march of history. So I think that technology brings enlightenment. It brings understanding between people and lessens the fires of war. I think we will always have wars because we will have disagreements, but the intensity, the ferocity of war, I think will be decreased because the internet brings empowerment. Empowerment brings democracy. It is possible that we could go backwards because, of course, we have nuclear weapons. We have designer germs that can wipe out whole populations. We have global warming. But the point is that, yes, we can go backwards. But I think the march of history is forward. I have the privilege of being able to interact with top scientists. And every time I talk to these scientists, I ask them the question. I ask them the question of all questions. Is there intelligent life on the Earth? I believe they're out there. Okay. Whether or not they have visited us, we can debate that. But our galaxy contains 100 billion stars. Just in the galaxy, tonight you can look at it, the Milky Way. And how many galaxies are there? 100 billion galaxies we can see with our telescopes. So how many stars are there? 100 billion times 100 billion. To think that we are the only intelligent species in the world, in the universe, I think is the, the, the ultimate mistake. There's simply too many universes, too many worlds out there. I don't know when we will make contact, but I think in this century, 
there is a very good chance that we'll pick up a signal, a signal from another planet. I think in this century, we might be able to pick one up like that. And that could be a tremendous event in human history, because in human history, we've never had that before. The meeting with an intelligent civilization, perhaps more advanced than ours. We are brainwashed by Hollywood to think that robots are so smart, they can take over very soon. But if you compare a military robot to an animal, what animal would correspond to a military robot? The answer is a cockroach. You put a cockroach in a forest, the cockroach finds food, shelter, mates, creates a home. You take a military robot and put it in the forest, and what do you get? Junk. The robot falls over, tries to scramble, cannot even get up, cannot navigate in a forest where there are no roads. But eventually they will become as smart as a mouse, then as smart as a rat, then as smart as a cat, a dog, and maybe as smart as a monkey. At that point, they're dangerous because monkeys are self-aware. They know they're not humans. Now dogs, dogs are confused. Dogs think that we are a dog. We're the top dog. They're the underdog. That's why dogs get confused. Monkeys are not confused. Monkeys know they are monkeys. At that point, they are potentially dangerous. So at that point, maybe a hundred years from now, who knows, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts. But then the question is, what happens if they're so smart, they remove that chip maybe 200 years from now? At that point, I don't know, if they become that intelligent, I think maybe we should think about merging with them. Remember, this is way in the future. People will democratically decide and vote whether or not to absorb the technology of our robots and become superhuman. And remember that being superhuman may not be such a bad thing. We can explore the universe, thrive on different planets, create colonies throughout the universe. If we have a superhuman body, if we decide to merge with our creations rather than fight them for dominance. When I was a young man learning history for the first time, we learned about the sick man of Asia. The sick man of Asia was China and India. Too many poor people, too many mouths to feed. They will always be poor. Wrong. <laughs> what happens when you educate them? When you educate these people, all of a sudden, instead of creating a minus, you create a plus. They create wealth, not consume wealth. And that's what's happening in areas around the world. Education, empowerment of young people reverses the poverty that goes back thousands of years. And then what creates wealth? How do you get wealth? Well, a politician says that wealth comes from taxes. You tax Peter to pay Paul. But that's a zero-sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. You talk to an economist, where does wealth come from? And the economist says, print money. But if you print money, eventually money becomes worthless. I say wealth comes from science and technology, from the steam engine, to the light bulb, to the motor, to the dynamo, to nuclear weapons, to the computers of today, all of it was driven by science. And that's what I think the museum should emphasize. Where does wealth come from? It doesn't come from printing money, doesn't come from taxes, it comes from innovation, science, and technology. I think that the cities of today are where the jobs are. Economic activity is what drives people from the countryside into the urban areas, because that's where you get a paycheck. That's where economic activity takes place. But as long as that economic activity is concentrated in such a small area, it means that the population soars and that creates congestion, pollution, 
problems and all sorts of things. So there are several possible solutions to that. One of them is to go underground, to build layers of the cities not on top of each other, but below each other into the soil. That's a possibility. But I think that uh, another possibility is to distribute jobs elsewhere. Jobs do not have to be located in cities, but that's why we have these megalopolis, because that's where, that's where wealth is. That's where economic activity is. But I think we can disperse that so that it's not concentrated in certain areas uh, that are just too dense.